innovations and their, the energy that they put into their teaching. And we'll focus on, uh, they, as you'll see, will focus on one aspect of their philosophy and our host will tell you a little bit more about the, the competition rules and so forth in just a minute. But they'll focus on one aspect of the philosophy and then show, demonstrate, talk about how they enact that in the classroom. So it moves from the abstract to the actual, uh, the activation. So we in the grad school and self believe that the skills gained through teaching are among the most valuable and transferable of skills that graduate students develop uh, while they're in graduate school. Over the past few years with the shifts in the job market for graduate students, the graduate school has invested time and resources in preparing graduate students to diversify their career options, uh, along with our partner, the Stucker Career Center. So research and teaching have a common denominator, which is the goal of improving lives. So great teaching by our TAs has the capacity to improve the lives of those who are teaching, the TAs themselves, but it also can improve the lives of the undergraduate students, certainly that they're teaching, as well as the lives of the, the people, students and people that the undergrads will eventually touch. So on behalf of the Graduate School in CELT, I applaud the brave souls tonight who are here to share their insights and skills with us. Uh, and I applaud the audience too. Give yourself a round of applause for coming out tonight to support this. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, Dean Podrick Kinney. He's, uh, he's the Dean of the Graduate School and uh, he, he wants to say a few words of greetings. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to express my appreciation to the team at the grad school, especially uh, Morris Scrubs, for their amazing work in, in making um, uh, this event possible. You know, the one thing I would say is that I think we all know we've been in situations far outside of the university, maybe in some office somewhere or even interacting with someone, you know, in, in a you know, at a, at a party or on an airplane or whatever, and realizing this person really knows how to teach. Just from the way they convey information, tell a story, put it together, make you interested in whatever it is that they, uh, that you didn't know you should be interested in until you started speaking with them. Um, and whenever that happens, that is a reminder that when we're teaching, when we're engaging in teaching, it's not just about the experience of being in a classroom, but about our, our entire, you know, the entire lives that we have in front of us, no matter where we go. I hope that many of you will, in fact, uh, hear and um, both in the audience and among the, the, uh, the expert teachers who will be presenting, will be teaching in the classroom. But if you're not, I know this is going to be a really uh, incredibly useful experience, one of the many you'll take out of graduate school. So I am really looking forward to seeing some of the great teaching. I have to say, I always feel I've taught for a long time, but I always feel uh, just awed in the presence of people who are who know what it is they want to say and know how they want to present it. I always learn something from that, both about the teaching and about the content as well. So I'm here to learn, and I guess a lot of you are here to teach. So let's let's do that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dean Kinney, and I will just say a quick word of thanks to uh, Chad Gilpin. Chad is somewhere around the back in one of those rooms. Uh, hey, Chad, thank, thank Chad if you get a chance for helping to organize all this. Ashley did most of it in terms of getting the judges. She orchestrated with CELT the preliminaries and so forth. So she did so much work behind the scenes. But tonight she is in front hosting so please welcome Dr. Ashley Sorrell. All right, thank you so much, Morris. Um, they asked if I was gonna have jokes. I said only if I could use ChatGPT for the jokes because AI is funnier than I am. But what I'm gonna do now is kind of take you through on what to expect tonight and Grad Teach Live, um, you know, what the rules are, et cetera, all that exciting stuff. 
So here are the rules. Participation must focus their presentation on teaching in the classroom or lab at the college level. They were only allowed one presentation slide, so one static slide that somehow encompasses what they do in the classroom. They can use additional props as costumes, etc. They only have three minutes to do this as well, so this is quite, uh, quite the challenge as far as communicating an aspect of your philosophy and then how you put that into practice. So we do have a timer for the three minutes, and that will start once the presenter begins speaking. And of course, the decision of our wonderful judges is final, and we will go over who our judges are right now. First, we have Dr. Jill Abney. She is an associate director of the Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching here at UK. She directs CELT's Teaching Innovation Institute and serves as the Associate Director of the UK JHF Holocaust Education Initiative. She also teaches courses for UK's Department of History, such as History Research Methods and War and Society. Her pedagogical interest, research interests include fostering belonging in the classroom and inclusive te teaching. Prior to arriving at UK, she held positions as an assistant teaching professor of history at the University of Southern Mississippi and a secondary social studies teacher in Madison County, Kentucky. Second, we have Dr. Rashid Flowers. He is an assistant professor of kinesiology and health promotion at UK. He received his PhD in higher education in 2022 with a concentration in sports leadership from the University of Kentucky. Rashid is involved in the Lexington community through volunteering with various organizations and coaching wrestling and track at local high schools. He, re he has received in various athletic roles from he has served in various athletic roles from administration, coaching, management, etc. Most recently, Rashid completed an internship with the National Christian College Athletic Association. Rashid teaches several undergraduate courses, which include management of sport, psychology, and sociology of physical education and sport, and history and philosophy of physical education and sport. And I should also mention that Dr. Flowers is a previous Grad Teach Live winner himself. So. We have Dr. Amber, and you told me how to pronounce it, now I forgot it. Chatelaine, she is an associate, associate professor of marketing at Midway University in Midway, Kentucky. She is an award-winning educator specializing in marketing, management, and entre entrepreneurship, CSR merchandising, and educational leadership. Additionally, during her 16-year tenure in higher education, Dr. Chatelaine has received recognitions for, recognition for achievements in research and innovative teaching ped pedagogy, including 10 teaching awards. Dr. Chatelaine earned a bachelor's and master's degree in merchandising apparel and textiles and a college teaching and learning certificate from the University of Kentucky, a doctorate of education and educational leadership from Argosy University, and will be conferring her doctor of, doctorate of business administration and management and entrepreneurship from, Mar from Marshall University this April. So those are our judges, all very uh, skilled and award-winning in their own teaching. So we are excited and thankful to have you all here with us today. We ask that you please silence your cell phones. We have no dancing popcorn to tell you this. But. All right, so the competition um, begins and I will just introduce each presenter before they come out and the title of their talk. So first up, we have Excel Andy and Excel will be talking to us about building self-confidence in first aid skills. From, she is from Kinesiology and Health Promotion. Good day, everyone. My name is Excel Andy. I'm a graduate teaching assistant in the University of Kentucky, Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion. I will be talking on building self-confidence in first aid skill. My teaching philosophy is encouraging self-confidence through the knowledge learned in the classroom in real life situation. Think about this. What would you do if somebody seated by your side was going through a heart attack? 
but you know the knowledge you know the signs and symptoms you know everything to do but you lack the confidence so for my students in the classroom i use three methods to make them feel confident because they already know what to do the first thing i do is demonstration in my class, it's an hybrid class, we watch videos from the American Red Cross and I, the instructor, have to demonstrate it for them because I believe my students will do better when they see me do it. So, example, if I was to teach on choking, demonstrate care for a responsive choking adult and I gave a scenario, what would you do if your dad was having a lunch and your dad is choking? Instinct tells you, call 911. But then you remember, in the last class, my TA told us, do this. So, I demonstrate for the student okay when somebody is choking go beside the person put your hand give five bad blows and give three five abdominal thrusts that leads me to coaching my students saw me when i demonstrated with one of them so i make all of them come to the mat everybody gets a partner and then what did you do if your partner was choking and then they demonstrate okay five bad blows we do this and we do five abdominal thrusts so after that, I watch my students and I guide them step by step. I ensure every student is doing it. This leads me to the final one, which is evaluation. I want to see my students do this outside without me. I want to be sure they can do it unsupported. I give them two ways. I give them the written test because they have to go home, go study the signs and symptoms. They have to know the knowledge so they can recognize it. And then they come to class the following week because we meet once in a week. And then they demonstrate. And I say, okay, this is another scenario you are alone what would you do and then this student do it for me so at the end of the semester I look at every other grade and this helps me to certify my students in CPR, AED and first aid thank you so much thank you XL is it true that you do the CPR to staying alive? That'd be, no, no nobody's heard that. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, great. Next up, we have Haiyu Chen from Communication, and she is going to be talking about lifelong learners, transforming teaching into a source of motivation and inspiration. Hi. Before we start, let's recall one learning experience and raise your hand if you have been inspired by an instructor to learn more about something even outside the classroom. Thank you. This question linked to my teaching philosophy, which I believe teaching is to inspire students to become self-motivated lifelong learner. I am Fai Chen from Communication Department. Today, I would like to talk about three practices that support my teaching philosophy. The first practice is to increase enjoyment by beginning each class with an engaging game that connects key concepts and following discussions to the topic of the lecture. Feel free to reach out afterwards if you are interested in incorporating games in classroom. Communication research found that enjoyable experiences motivate ongoing learning. Therefore, these games motivate students to learn more about the course materials by raising their attention and curiosity to the course content. The second practice is to enhance involvement by inviting students to lead a 10-minute discussion that they find interesting in. In my communication theory courses, students need to lead a case study and propose three open-ended questions, just like a teacher. They these <laughs> leading facilitating practices motivate students' ongoing learning by inviting them to propose meaningful questions and following discussions that truly matter to themselves. The final practice is to encourage reflection by 
inviting students to brainstorm knowledge that they learn from the classroom and apply to the real world situation. In my interpersonal communication courses, students brainstorm strategies that they learn from the classroom to advance their personal relationships. This reflection time benefits students' ongoing learning by inviting them to apply knowledge from the lecture to the real world situations. To sum up, I would like to share one personal story that describes my, why my teaching philosophy is meaningful. I grew up in a culture where learning is simply a way to get good grades. I have been in struggle with the purpose of learning until I realized learning can be self-motivated, ongoing process of discovering answer through enjoyment, involvement, and reflection. Therefore, I am dedicated to create a supportive environment where teaching is not only educational, but a source of inspiration and motivation. Thank you. Thank you, Hayu. Okay, great. Next up, we have Stephen Farley in Educational Policy Studies and Evaluation, who is going to be telling us about engaging future educators. Stephen? Everyone clap once, one big time with me on three. One, two, three. Perfect. Now we're all on the same page. My name is Steven. I'm a teaching assistant in the College of Education in the Educational Policy Studies and Evaluation. We finally refer to as EPE, and it's just that much easier to say. I have the privilege as a TA of teaching future educators, which also comes with the realization that my teaching philosophy can impact that of future educational leaders. And so with that, I'm here to show how my teaching philosophy uh, um, is best encapsulated by this quote by Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember. Involve me, bold underline, and I learn. The key there is involve. I truly believe that students learn best when they're fully engaged and involved in the classroom as well as throughout their learning process. There are three keys I use to enact this philosophy uh, as I teach. The first is a shared ownership of learning experience. I do my best, I want my students to feel that they have a control over what they're learning throughout the semester. I do this in, in a few different ways. Um, one, I allow them the opportunity uh, from day one as we're going through the syllabus to give me feedback on the syllabus. I tell them it's a working document and that they're welcome to offer any changes uh, that they wish to assignments, other minor things, and I give them to the second day of class uh, to give that feedback to me. I do the same with some of the assignments as well. Um, the second key to enacting my philosophy is feedback. I find this is important. I uh, encourage students to give me feedback, and I do this in multiple ways as well. One such way is administering a mid-semester survey. I give it to the students. It's completely optional for them to do. But I ask them questions such as, what's going well this semester? But also, what can I, as your instructor, best do uh, to better support you? What's going well in the class? And also, importantly, what is it? I want to get their feedback so, again, I can make adjustments as necessary and make sure uh, that they are involved uh, in their learning. 
Uh, the third key to enacting this philosophy is creating a collaborative environment within the classroom. I do my best to make sure I uh, do several methods such as think, pair, share activities, um, other group work and assignments, and even the physical layout of the classroom environment is really important. I do my best to clump desk when I can and make other adjustments to encourage uh, a very collaborative and engaging environment as best that I can. So these are the three uh, key principles that lead to my overall teaching philosophy uh, of better engaged and better involved future educators. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So while we wait, we do have folks joining us on Zoom. So let me take some time to welcome our Zoom audience as well. And we're okay. We ready to move on? Okay. All right. So next up, we have Eleanor Hutt from Communication, and she is going to talk about propaganda proof using propaganda to teach mass media theory. Very nice. Thank you. People don't tend to think of vaccines as a form of teaching, but fundamentally that's what they're designed to do. By exposing ourselves to a small, safe amount of a disease, we teach them to respond to that threat when they see it in the real environment. In the same way that COVID-19 and the flu threaten the health of our bodies, propaganda threatens the health of our minds. It disguises itself as neutral information while subtly persuading us, so subtly that we may not even realize it. One of the ways that propaganda subtly persuades is through what we in communication call framing, the strategic, purposeful selection of language to shape audience attitudes about a particular topic. As an instructor in communication theory, which can be a dense, abstract topic, my philosophy has always been that it is my job to bring these theories to life for my students. So I thought, what if I could bring framing theory to life by showing how it can be used to make propaganda? and in the process, help my students become a bit more able to recognize propaganda when they come across it. So that's what I did. On the screen are two slides from two Instagram infographics that I created for my class. These infographics tell the same story slide for slide, the story of the labor demonstrations by the Labor Union International Workers of the World in Spokane, Washington in the early 1900s, something students typically don't know a little a whole lot about so they get to learn the story but as you can see by these two images one of them frames the IWW as peaceful demonstrators with a righteous cause the other frames them as agitators disrupting the peace with no legitimate grievance in small groups students are assigned to read one of the two infographics and answer the reflection questions at the end these questions ask things like, whose side of the story is this infographic telling, and how do you know? To answer these questions, they're encouraged to talk to peers who read the other infographic, read the other infographic themselves, and seek out depictions of the story from other sources to compare against. Students are frequently stunned by the extent to which simple language choices can shape their perception of an event. They ask questions like, how can they be an almost violent mob in one of these and peaceful protesters in the other? The answer to that question is framing. But the question is almost more essential because being able to ask questions like this is the cornerstone of being media literate. So through this exercise, my students get to apply their theoretical knowledge and use it to inform critical questions. To that end, I've made these infographics available on Instagram, as you can see, for public and educational use, because everyone has the right to develop these skills. My students are becoming propaganda-proof, and now, so can all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor.
Okay. Next up, we have Muntenrayo Oladel, who is going to be talking to us about cultivating engaging learning spaces in chemistry laboratory. No easy time. <laughs> I firmly believe that they are not bad students, just that students are shaped by their teachers' learning approaches. And my teaching philosophy is centered around cultivating and engaging learning space. I do so using three approaches, critical thinking, involvement, and relevance. To start with critical thinking, this is not just about providing answers, but empowering your students to find answers to their own questions. And I use problem-solving approaches. So I teach in an organic chemistry laboratory, and my students are taxed with carrying out experiments. During our fifth experiment, my student Sarah was really frustrated with our experiment. It wasn't just going as planned. Then I approached her and I took her through the learning, through the thinking approach. I asked her questions such as, what went wrong and how can we fix this together? Ultimately, she was able to provide solutions to their own question and she was very, very, very excited. I've always told my student that you really have to think critically because I would not be there at all times to provide answers to your own questions. But I make them see these challenges as an opportunity for growth. Secondly, involvement. This is about creating an environment where every student are valued, where every student's opinions are welcome, and where every student's voices are heard. Whenever I ask questions in the laboratory, sometimes my students are really hesitant to give me a response. They think that their answers are not good enough. But I tell them, just share what you're thinking with me. Let me know what you're thinking. And when they do that, they are a little bit anxious, then I encourage them. And sometimes they are even right. This makes them share more with me and they are very confident to do that. Then I build on this for further responses. And I've seen firsthand how this has helped my students have a sense of belonging. It has helped me get them more involved. And ultimately, they have a common growth mindset across board. Talking about relevance, chemistry is really heavyweight, not just in the laboratory. And I've made my students see chemistry everywhere they go. Not only when they are hiking, during shopping, even at the cafeteria. The first kind of example we have was when they had to use sodium bicarbonate in the laboratory. And even my student Katie was surprised to know that sodium bicarbonate is just baking soda. And now, we are very excited to use baking soda in baking cakes and cookies, but also in carrying out chemistry experiments. Speaking about baking, what happens when you add baking soda to a lifeless floor or dough? It swells, it rises. The same way my students think, learn, and grow. And I see firsthand how this approach has made them really think critically, have relevance in the laboratory, and find themselves involved. Just because I've been able to create an environment where they can thrive. And I've seen that this three approach would not make a bad student. It can only make them get better and best at what they do, even beyond the classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited for chemistry now, and I did not like chemistry. Okay, great. So our next participant, our next finalist, is Inna Priscala from Sociology. And Inna's going to be talking to us about the foundational ingredients for lifelong learners. Every semester, I start off the course by saying, this class is kind of like a charcuterie board. Hear me out. You've got one subject here, another lesson there, a sprinkle of theory here, and a dash of terms that you have yet to know what they mean. You're going to learn a little bit of everything, and I specialize. Of course, that's also the challenge of something like sociology. You're expected to cover everyday life, our social world. And sometimes, regardless of what level you're teaching at, it's just not enough. So your students are left hungry for more. And the hunger emerges naturally. They find themselves picking away at a specific lesson, only to find out that it's a lot more interesting than they would have thought. 
it turns into a craving, something that they wish had more space on the very board that they're snacking from. And all of this is intentional, right? Because every component on the board, in the classroom, is meant to be seen as not a full course meal, but an experience. Because I'm pushing my students to try a little bit of everything on the board. From lesson to lesson, they see how each piece pairs well, how it expands their understanding of the social world. And that's allowing them to learn new things, to ask new questions, to have new perspectives, to see things that maybe the field hasn't considered before. You're going to learn a lot of different things in this space. And all of it has a purpose, right? It has to. When we think about cravings, right, we're looking for ways to satisfy them. So I'm pushing my students to make their own recipes, to turn snacks into meals, to make something so delicious that it has folks rushing for a spot at the table. And not just that, but we want to make those meals accessible so that everybody gets a plate. My lessons and my lectures, they're all just ingredients, from empirical research to something as spicy as gender norms. You're going to learn a little bit of everything because they're basic ingredients. You have to try it all so that we know what you're making. And I put the power back into my students' hands by asking them to make educational resources that are right, meant to educate those who have never stepped foot into the world of sociology. And sometimes even that's not enough. But good, right? Great, because my students have worked hard to make these meals. They genuinely want to feed others with the knowledge that they have. So I ask them, take what you know, use that sociological imagination, use your positions, and advocate for those who can't quite advocate for themselves. Students are mindful of more palates out there than I am. But now that they know all of the issues that surround our social world, they can take that knowledge, they can take these recipes, and share them with other people. Because in my classroom, although we've awoken an appetite, we agree that no one is allowed to go or to stay hungry. Okay, so next up we have Nadia Sasse from Communication, and Nadia will be talking about a universal design approach to developing confident public speakers. Nadia? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. My students tell me this is hard. My name is Nadia Cisse, and I teach persuasive speaking in the College of Communication and Information. I turn anxious speakers into confident public speakers in one semester. The road to confident public speaking unfolds differently for every learner. So I implement universal design for learning in my classroom to guide every student to success. UDL is a teaching framework that recognizes each of us learns differently and strives to achieve learning for all people. There are three principles of UDL. The first is engagement. This means I optimize my students' autonomy in their learning and provide opportunities for active participation. For example, I offer icebreakers that students may answer from their seats, standing up, or the brave few at the front of the classroom. Students can even design their own icebreakers. Personalized icebreakers get students talking about topics that are meaningful to them that may not otherwise find space in our curriculum. The best part is they get practice speaking in front of each other. The second principle is representation. This means 
I show concepts in a variety of ways. For example, I show a speech of the day every day so that students can see our concepts lifted off the textbook, off my lecture slides, and put into action. So we talk about confident public speaking, but showing students videos immerses them in the content even more. We even see examples of what not to do, and students find value and humor in that too. The third principle is action and expression, and that means I provide students multiple opportunities to engage with our learning content. They, after giving speeches, provide self-reflections that they can write, provide a PowerPoint, or another format that suits them. I get richer responses that let me know they comprehend public speaking. UDL is a framework that brings equity in my classroom. At the end of the semester, I've achieved my curriculum goals, and I have a classroom of confident public speakers that beam back at me. Just ask him. Thank you. <laughs> Our final finalist of the night is Cassie Jane Working from the Department of History, and she is going to speak from Soldiers Pets to Stanley Cups. I just have to say this, the obligatory colon we use in history. Humanizing college experience in the classroom. Cassie? is a collage of experiences. And just like collages, our students' lives are complicated, chaotic, busy, exciting, sad, resilient, and I embrace it all in my classroom. They don't need to figure it all out, because we're going to figure it out together. And just like history, I define history as the diverse experiences of complicated people over space and time. Not much different from our students in 2024. My teaching philosophy is rest on three main components. I enliven the past, empathize with my students, and help them empathize with themselves and others. And third, I empower my students. I enliven the past by showing my energy and genuine excitement to be with them. The best part of my day is teaching, and I tell them that. I wear my LinkedIn shirt, my Union Civil War hat, because I study the Civil War, and I show them that their experiences are not much different than historical actors. Civil War soldiers went through breakups too, and it didn't go well. He crossed off the face of his former girlfriend or wife. If only she, he had a Civil War song, a Taylor Swift song as well. They also loved pets. This is Little Corporal, who followed his Ohio Regiment of the United States Army from battle to battle, providing companionship and love, just like my tabby cat Twister does for me. And even Stanley Cups have a history. It goes back to 1915, believe it or not. It's William Stanley created the technology. This is an advertisement from the 1920s, saying that the Stanley was the perfect Christmas gift for motorists and picnickers alike. So they're participating in a history, possibly even having it on their desk while they're in your class. But content isn't enough to be impactful for students. You also need to build community and empathy. I memorize all of their names. I welcome them as they come in by saying their name. I email them individually and let them know that I care. I check in with them. I let them know when they're succeeding. And I also let them know how I can help, that I'm there. I also even have a final exam waffle breakfast. Now, this exam was at 8 AM in the morning. This is at 7 AM. I'm flipping waffles and talking about the Battle of Gettysburg, making a memory for all of us involved. And I also am a bridge to resources. Because as much as history is important, the, what's most important is their well-being. So I give them a survival kit of important resources on campus, number one being the counseling center. So I provide that to them, and they consistently remind them that mental health is important to me, and it should be important to you as well and to empathize with those needs. And to understand when we talk about hard histories of injustice throughout space and time, that students can better empathize, if they can empathize with themselves, can better empathize with the experiences of others. And last but not least, I empower. I want my students to be informed Americans who vote, who feel confident to share their voice, their voice, and who believe in themselves and know that they belong here at UK. And I always end my semester, the final thing, they come up to the desk, 
they hand their final exam, and in exchange, I give them a note that looks very much like this, and I tell them that they will always have a friend in the history department. Thank you. I like that one too. <laughs> so much. So now we've reached um, the point of the evening where the judges will retire to a secret back room out there back here to uh, confer on their scores and to select first, second, third place winners for cash prizes of 700 or monetary prizes. We don't carry cash on us for 750 five hundred and two hundred and fifty dollars now is also the time folks on zoom and in the room that you get to vote for people's choice award by scanning this qr code or entering the shortened link link or number two option there and voting for who you would choose to win grad teach live so we're going to leave this up for a little bit for you all to get your votes in. The judges are going to go confer in the back, and then I will be back up to announce all of our winners.
Okay, welcome back everyone. The judges have conferred and had great conversation. Uh, they all agreed and I agree that this is very, very hard. Everyone did such a great job, so inspirational. And I do want to thank our participants for having um, the courage to come up here and do this. I know it wasn't easy. Um, so thank you so much. Let's go ahead and give them a hand. All right. All right. So for third place, we have Cassie Jane Working from Soldiers Pets to Stanley Cups. And the winner of 250000 <laughs> I'm glad the dean isn't here. $250, so TJ. You, <laughs> you can come stand. We're going to get pictures. So. All right. Second place for $500, Montenreo Oladell. And first place, $750, Nadia Cisse. And then our People's Choice Award winner, $250, Montereo Oladeo. All right, thank you again so much to our participants. Thank you so much to our judges. Again, fantastic job to everybody, and it was very, very hard decision. We appreciate you all for coming out, celebrating all the work that our teaching assistants do. And if we can ask all participants um, to stay just for a little bit so we can get some photos and the winners as well. Thank you.